Hello everyone and welcome back to One Soccer. I'm your host for today, Josh Deming, and we are back with another episode of our Canadians Abroad Summer Series. I first want to start off by thanking Adam Jenkins so much for covering for me last week. I really appreciate it, but we're back in business and there's a lot to talk about. We got the U20 recap, our women's national team is back in action, and there's going to be a new manager in charge of Lille and in charge of Jonathan David. We're going to hear from Adam Jenkins as well as Alex Gongay ruzik so hopefully you guys are excited, and if you are, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub, and let's get into the episode now. The Canadian men's national team have accomplished so much over the past year, and we were hoping that our U20 side would follow suit. Canada participated in the CONCACAF U20 Championship and there was a lot on the line. If they were able to make it to the final four to the semi-finals, they would have qualified for the U20 World Cup, and if they would have made it to the finals, they would have qualified for the Olympics. CONCACAF nations thrived to try to qualify for these two competitions, and unfortunately for Canada, we fell a bit short. Canada started off the U20 Championship in the group stage taking on Cuba, and they suffered a disappointing 1-0 defeat. They followed up with a pretty impressive 2-2 draw against the US on paper, even though the performance probably suggested that they were lucky to get away with a point. They finished off the group stage with a big 4-0 win against St. Kitts and Nevis, but ultimately it was a bit of a disappointing performance once again. Despite a shaky group stage, it looked like Canada had a decent path to head to the semi-finals. First task up was Guatemala. Despite playing 90 minutes at 0-0, it was a bit of an exciting match as both sides saw a penalty saved. They went to extra time where a penalty was finally converted by Habibula for Canada, which made it 1-0. But late in the match, late in extra time, Guatemala equalized to send this to a penalty shootout. During the penalty shootout, luck wasn't on Canada's side as Guatemala walked away with a 4-3 penalty shootout win to head to the quarterfinals and eliminate Canada's opportunity at representing at the U-20 World Cup and the Olympics. There's no doubt Canada was underprepared for this tournament. It, it doesn't take a very trained eye to understand that Canada came together. They looked like they were still building the chemistry all the way up into the round of 16. And then by then it's too late. If you can't get it done against Guatemala in a penalty shootout in the round of 16, we have to ask ourselves some pretty important questions in this country about this team. How much does Canada want to invest in the youth or is the strategy just to let the talent speak for itself, trust the academies, trust the professional teams and leagues, and then handpick a couple of players, Tejan Buchanan, perhaps now Justin Smith. If that's all Canada wants, if that's all Canada's willing to invest in, we're not going to make it to the Olympics on the men's side of things for a very, very long time. So there's gonna be a lot of questions to ask, how does Canada invest the money from the windfalls of participating in Qatar and then co-hosting in 2026? It's a massive conversation, but it's an important conversation. And really it is up to the Federation, the CSA, the CSB to decide how much success they expect to have out of these national teams instead of just hoping for the best when they come together for tournaments like this. There's no getting away from the fact that this was a disappointing tournament for Canada, but the one big bright spot that Canadians can take away is Justin Smith. Justin Smith is a dual national eligible for both Canada and France. He played in this tournament, he played very well in this tournament, and as we know, he can play as a number six and a center back, which is an important position for Canada moving forward. There's no doubt that this was a massive disappointment for the Canadian men's national team on a team level, but on a personal level, I don't think there'll be a player that's happier than Justin Smith. We know about the positional weakness that the Canadian men's national team has at center back, and we know that we're looking to the future on who might replace some of the aging veterans that currently comprise that back line for John Herdman. Justin Smith showed us that he has the size, the speed, the skill, the ability to manage games, and the ability to grow within the system. And that is massive, especially having that familiarity now with Mauro Biello. I really don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that Justin Smith could be on a rise similar to Tejan Buchanan was after Guadalajara. And what stuck out the most for me was the sheer disappointment and frustration in his body language, in his voice, and in the way he handled himself in that post-match press conference following the loss to Guatemala. This is a player that cares. This is a player that wants to succeed and he has all the tools to do it. I don't think it's very long until we see Justin Smith in the Canadian men's national team system. Canadians will be hoping that Justin Smith takes a big step this season and will get some regular minutes for Nice and hopefully in his near future, a call up to the Canadian men's national team. Our Canadian women's national team was back in action against South Korea in a friendly, but before a kickoff, there were some achievements that needed to be rewarded. Ashley Lawrence, Kadisha Buchanan, and Jesse Fleming were all given jerseys with the number 100 on the back of them to recognize the fact that they all have 100 caps for the Canadian women's national team. Jesse Fleming is the latest addition to that list at the age of just 24. Now, Buchanan is 26 and Lawrence is 27. They're all very young, but the, at the age of 24 years old, to have 100 caps for your country is quite the achievement. 
It's quite impressive, really, to, to see how Jesse Fleming is, has grown and developed over almost what has been a decade now, and pretty much a decade with the, the Canadian women's national team. I mean, she's just grown from this fresh-faced newcomer on the block right from the, the young age. You could see her technical skill, her proficiency, but now she's just matured into a top, top player. Obviously, you see it all the time with Chelsea. Now you're seeing with Canada. This is one of Canada's leaders, arguably one of Canada's most important uh, players in their team. So it's super impressive to see just that 24, what she's become. Those first 100 caps were, were important. They were huge. And there, there's many more to come. I wouldn't be surprised to see Jesse Fleming hit 200 for Canada and continue to score important goals, pick up important assists, play all the big games as she already does for a country another appearance milestone that was celebrated before kickoff was for sophie schmidt who is celebrating over 200 caps for the canadian women's national team at the age of just 33 years old sophie schmidt has been an incredible player for the canadian women's national team in the heart of that midfield for over a decade now the final achievement being celebrated was the career of diana matheson who retired back in 2021 having over 200 caps for the canadian women's national team she was an important figure in that midfield and picked up bronze medals at the 2012 and 2016 Summer Olympics. There were some incredible scenes before kickoff, but unfortunately for the match, it was a bit of a dull one for the Canadian women's national team. Despite dominating possession, Canada drew South Korea 0-0 and Christine Sinclair did not feature in the match at all. It's definitely concerning seeing the goals dry up for the women's national team and they're definitely going to have to find a solution going forward if they want to compete and go deep in the CONCACAF Women's Championship. In terms of goals uh, for Canada, it's going to be a big ask for them uh, at the Women's uh, CONCACAF Women's Championship, specifically in the knockout rounds. I mean, in the first, in the group stage, they will be expected to score some goals. Uh, but once you get to, to the knockout rounds and you're likely facing a Mexico or a U.S. for, for a spot in the Olympics, you're going to need to find a way to put the ball in the back of the net. So for, for, for them, I think it's going to be more than just getting their their front three involved it's going to be progressing the ball at a, a better rate uh, you know diversifying the sides uh, from the field with, with which they attack um, just getting the strikers more involved maybe getting whoever starts up front Jordan Heidema if she is if Christine Sinclair's healthy she does do a good job of this of dropping deep and then just drawing whoever plays in wide areas be it Adriana Leone, Michelle Prince, Deanne Rose to get running in the channels and get inside and just get more shots from dangerous areas uh, and then from there it's just finishing I mean Canada's a, a pretty good job already of, of, of fin uh, you know creating chances it's now just about finishing them so it's a uh, it's a lengthy list of, of stuff but at the same time they are close they just need a, maybe a bit of a breakthrough and start making it more consistent as we know Jonathan David has been linked to numerous clubs we've had Madrid Inter Milan Arsenal and many many more However, the rumors have kind of dried up and it's looking likely that he may stay at Lille for another season. Fortunately for you Canadian fans out there, there is good news if that situation were to occur. Jocelyn Gorvenik has been released from his contract at the club and a replacement has finally been announced. Paulo Fonseca has been announced on a two-year contract for Lille and is going to have the opportunity to try to turn this team back into title contenders. Paulo Fonseca has an impressive coaching resume as he's managed at Porto, Braga, Shakhtar Donetsk, and most recently Roma. Fonseca has found success just about everywhere he went and he's going to have the opportunity to try to turn around the legal situation as well as get the best out of Jonathan David leading up to a World Cup year. Now, in my opinion, I believe with the announcement of Paulo Fonseca, staying at Lille for another season could be a very good move for Jonathan David. I'm going to be doing a video this week on why indeed it's a good idea for Jonathan David to stay at Lille for at least one more season, so be sure to tune in Sunday for One Soccer Presents. The Lorenzo Insigne hype is here and TFC fans are ecstatic that their player has finally joined them. Now it hasn't been an easy start to the season for TFC, but there was always that light at the end of the tunnel that a player of this caliber is coming to join this team. This is still a very young TFC side and a lot more pieces will need to be added for them to compete for the title. However, Lorenzo Insigne has insisted that he's coming here to win. He's going to bring that winning mentality that saw him go ahead and win a European championship. Lorenzo Insigne is making a lot of money and he's going to have a lot of expectations as well, but he seems to be up for the challenge. He's coming here to win. He's coming here to compete. And I think that the fans are going to get beside him. And if you add a few more pieces around this TFC squad, there's no doubt in my mind that they can compete for a title potentially this year, if not for sure with a few more pieces at the start of next season. Insigne, who just recently turned 31, is going to be compared for sure to Gareth Bale, who just recently joined the MLS as well. This is going to be an epic battle for this season to see which superstar can really take the MLS by storm. 
For TFC fans who are wondering when the first opportunity they'll be able to watch Lorenzo Insigne, it's looking likely that it could be Saturday, July 9th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time at BMO Field when TFC are going to take on the San Jose Earthquakes. Stefan Mitrovic could be on the move. The young, talented player has been linked to a move to Malmo in the Swedish League. Stefan Mitrovic has truly had a breakout season in the 2021-2022 season. In 35 matches, he scored 10 goals and had 2 assists. Stefan Mitrovic definitely has a big future in front of him. He's been linked to numerous clubs in the past. Clubs like Leicester City, Club Bruges, Red Star as well in the Serbian League. But it looks like his destination will be Malmo. There's something interesting to note that Malmo's head coach is indeed Serbian. So there's a definite connection there, bringing in some Serbian talent and help blossom this Malmo side. The deal is not confirmed right now, but it does look like it's a big possibility and it's going to be interesting for John Herman to keep a note on. Stefan Mitrovic definitely has an outside shot at looking at this national team, competing potentially for the Qatar 2022 spot, but if not, really blossom into the player that can compete for a 2026 spot. This move is a bold one from Stefan Mitrovic and we'll have to see if it pans out in the end if John Herman takes note. It seems like on every Canadians Abroad episode we talk about Kyle Lahren and that's because he's a free agent. And when you're a free agent, the opportunities are endless. More than likely right now, it looks like he's going to end up in Turkey or in Major League Soccer. We got clubs like Istanbul, Bashikshar, and Galatasaray still circling around Kyle Lahren, but there's concrete evidence that there's real interest in Major League Soccer. Columbus crew were interested in him for a DP spot before the signing of Hernandez, and there's also interest from NYCFC if Castellanos moves on, as well as LAFC before the signing of Gareth Bale. LAFC have one more open DP spot, so Kyle Aaron could have been that player, and you could have seen three Canadians playing for LAFC with Daniel Henry, Maxine Crapo, and Kyle Aaron. However, more than likely with the signing of Gareth Bale on TAM money, that is no longer probably realistic. If LAFC came knocking for Kyle Aaron, I'd find it hard to imagine he'd want to turn that down, given the fact that you have superstars like Chiellini and Gareth Bale there, on top of the fact of familiar faces with Daniel Henry and Maxine Crapo. Crepeau's definitely got to be enjoying life moving from the Whitecaps to LAFC and seeing this star power come there. The team is playing so well and they are heavy favorites, in my opinion, to win the MLS Cup. However, for Kyle Lahren, more than likely he wants to look for somewhere where he can come and be that star. I think if Castellanos moves on for NYCFC, that could be a real good opportunity for him to come in on DP money and be the leading the line for the starting striker for NYCFC. Whether it's going to Turkey or to Major League Soccer, one thing's for sure, Kyle Lahren's future is definitely open, and we're going to be here covering it until he signs for a new club. Now, Maxime Crapo has become a locked-on starter for LAFC. He's one of the most important players on this team and one of the best keepers in the league. However, for Daniel Henry, minutes aren't so easy to come by. He is already a little further down the pecking order, and with the signing of Chiellini, you would imagine that he's going to fall even further down the pecking order. This is a bit of a cause for concern because this is a player who wants to go to the World Cup, wants to potentially feature the World Cup, and if he's not getting starting minutes, maybe it's time to potentially take a look at his future and where it could potentially go because long term, I don't know if LAFC is going to be the opportunity to give him those type of minutes. Portland Thorns and Canadian Women's National Team star Janine Becky has commented on her team's fight for equality, and she's also called for FIFA to level the prize pools for World Cup qualification as well as other changes. Here's what she had to say. Um, you know, I think the collective mindset is is the best possible format for all all people involved all teams involved and i think that's the premise that we're operating on there's still you know conversations to be had and things to be done but we're moving in a really positive direction and i think it will be a monumental deal regardless of what the terms end at um, and you know i think with the men having the success that they've had in the last year and us having this you know most success we've seen as a team in the last year you know what a time to be a canadian player and to really make a statement in the world of football with with a deal like this so yeah safe to say we're moving very much in the right direction still some work to be done and we definitely won't we won't settle till we're really really happy with with what's happening but um definitely would say it's it's been really positive yeah i mean in, in our eyes equal dollars is equal pay um so you know how we get there is is yet to be determined and i think we're in those conversations and those conversations are happening and and there's a lot of moving pieces to it i think that's a lot of what people don't understand is it's it's not as black and white as it sounds you know equal pay equal dollars sounds really black and white but there's a lot that goes into it um you know it's a big discussion the discrepancy in FIFA money that teams receive when they qualify for the World Cup so that's something that has to be taken into consideration and I think also you know we we sign an equal pay deal you know Spain Holland the US are signing equal pay deals but the next step is to put the pressure on FIFA to close that gap because then it makes it not as difficult on federations to 
to give equal pay to both teams, which is absolutely what every federation in the world should be doing. Um, but obviously, it makes it more difficult when FIFA's dis 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 discrepancy is so big. So, you know, we that's a call to action to FIFA to change that. And hopefully we see a, a raise in the FIFA prize money next summer, uh, which we're planning on seeing. So, um, yeah, I think this team is so forward thinking and we've always been that way. And I'm really, really proud to be part of a team and a federation that wants to continue to take steps forward. Um, and I think we have so many people on our team that that want to do that and, and see that as a massive priority. You know, it's, it's not our job just to, to kick a ball around the field. It's to make this a better, better place to live in a, a better federation to play in than than it has been this whole time. You know, we want we want to leave places better than we found it, and I think we're well on our way there. That's everything for this week's edition of our Canadians Abroad Summer Series. I hope you guys did enjoy it, and if you did, as always, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub as well, guys. We're getting very close to 50,000 subscribers, so if you want to help us get there, as always, dropping a sub will definitely do that. Also, be sure to head over to One Soccer and subscribe for all the best Canadian soccer content. And until next time, guys, my name's Josh Deming. We'll talk to you guys soon. Cheers, friends. Oh,